Oh, wrong clip. Now, no disrespect to the classic, but being born in 1990 placed me squarely in the late 90s and early 2000s era of cartoons, which meant shows like X-Men and Spider-Man the Animated Series, and in fact a lot of the Animated Series, were on their way out just as I was getting to the age where you really start to enjoy those kind of action and superhero cartoons. And the end of the 90s and the start of the 2000s was a treasure trove of new shows of this type. Justice League aired in 2001, quickly becoming one of the most beloved incarnations of the team, and its hour-long episodes were well-suited for adapting the classic comic book stories that many of them were directly based on. Static Shock aired in 2000 and tackled social issues like gang violence and racism head-on, all while featuring a black lead written by the incredibly talented Dwayne McDuffie. Teen Titans aired in 2003 and combined serious, often season-long character arcs with a goofy anime-inspired style and lots of new takes for many of its characters. Even Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was revived in 2003 and followed closer to the original darker tone of the comics to incredible success and praise, even if now the original is still more commonly remembered by the average person. However, the series that most relates to the one we're talking about today is Batman Beyond. First aired in 1999, Batman Beyond is the perfect example of a bad idea gone right. The idea of an edgy teenage future Batman sounds disastrous on paper, but the execution of it was flawless. The Gotham City of the future was a gorgeous cyberpunk megacity inspired by the likes of Akira and Blade Runner, Terry McGinnis, the new Batman, was a fully realized character of his own with an almost entirely original supporting cast of friends, family, and enemies, and he wasn't just defined by being a teenager. And having an uh, old crotchety Bruce Wayne helped the show maintain a balance between old and new by linking itself to both Batman the Animated Series and Justice League later on. However, this review series isn't about Batman Beyond, it's about X-Men Evolution, the other show of that era that decided taking legacy superhero characters and making them teenagers was the path to success. However, unlike Batman Beyond, X-Men Evolution was more similar to its source material than not. The X-Men, after all, were originally a team of teenagers led by Professor X. However, while Teenage X-Men have always been a common occurrence in the comics on other teams, the primary team has been mostly adults for a very long time at this point. This can be seen in both series surrounding X-Men Evolution, X-Men the animated series before it, and Wolverine and the X-Men after it, which both feature a much more heavily adult cast. However, Evolution goes a step further and brings the teenage part of the team to the forefront, with the students of Xavier's Academy also attending the local high school, Bayville High. Thankfully, however, the show creators were smart enough to realize that not every popular X-Men team member they wanted to use would work as a teenager. Wolverine, Storm, Beast, and of course Professor X are all adults and function as the faculty at Xavier's school. While the series is held back early on by simple plots and some cringe-inducing early 2000s dialogue, over its four seasons it quickly grows into what is easily a contender for the best X-Men cartoon of all time. But before we get there, we have to get through season one, starting with episode one, Strategy X. For the first episode, we'll be taking a much more scene-by-scene -scene look than future videos will, since we're being introduced to a lot of characters at once and there's a lot of background information to parse. So with that said, let's get into Strategy X. Our first episode starts off about as teenager as you can get. A high school football match between the Bayville High Hawks and uh, some other team. Let's call them the other high blue guys. Right off the bat, we get a good sense of our characters and conflicts at play here. We meet Duncan, whose reoccurring role in the series is being a horrible bastard, even by jock bully stereotype standards, 
and Jean Grey, who's apparently into him despite how much of an obvious bully he is, and takes photographs for the school yearbook. Speaking of, Duncan and his jock crew spot Todd Talansky snatching wallets and decide taking a short time out to pummel the hell out of him will be really good for their morale. However, Scott Summers also notices the pickpocketing and decides to put a stop to it himself. Scott, however, argues for just having Talansky return the cash instead of beating the poor guy into a pulp first. Naturally, Duncan being the reasonable person he is, proceeds to ignore Scott and is about to straight up give Talansky's head a nice ground stomp before Scott intervenes, giving Talansky the chance to escape. Duncan starts throwing down, Gene accidentally distracts Scott for a moment, he gets knocked into a pillar, and... Ah, jeez, man, maybe you should have an elastic strap on that thing or something. We pick up after the intro with a quick introduction to Gene's telekinetic abilities, and Professor Xavier showing up, planting a more likely cause for the explosion than punch laser eye blast into the investigating officer's head. We get a quick scene of Gene fawning over the injured Duncan, despite knowing that the only reason he was injured in the first place was him starting fights. Along with a quick shot of Scott, obviously distressed by how poorly Gene is being written at this point in the show, over some sweet moody guitar riffs. Uh, thanks. Really, you know? We also see fully that Talansky himself is a mutant, who I will now refer to as Toad just for simplicity's sake. Charles hurries away from the scene to pick up the new student Kurt, who we briefly see heavily covered in clothing. Cut to Wolverine, showing up and doing what he does best, riding around on motorcycles, calling people bub, and having a nice tall, uh, water. I mean, it is a kid's show after all. Out of sheer laziness and disregard for keeping mutant secret, Wolverine slices the top off the bottle instead of just twisting the lid off like a sane person, and catches up on news of the explosion before riding off as retreated to a beautiful rotating shot of Sabretooth. Back at the mansion, we're fully introduced to Kurt Wagner, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler is given a watch by Xavier that camouflages his appearance with a hologram so that he can attend Bayville High School with the rest of the students. Meanwhile, Toad is being pressured by Principal Darkholm to do something against the X-Men, and we see her turn into a monstrous demon form to intimidate him. A brief interaction with Toad and Scott leads to an introduction to Cerebro being able to detect mutant powers, which I could understand something like Scott's powers, but how does it know the difference between Toad just jumping around and mutant hopping? Does his tongue only trigger Cerebro if he sticks it out a certain distance? Toad shows up at the X-Mansion, where Professor X sends Storm to audition him by attacking him with lightning, which seems just a bit over the top. Toad ends up flying into the mansion and runs into Nightcrawler, resulting in a chase that causes at least a few thousand dollars of property damage before Nightcrawler accidentally teleports them into the danger room, which automatically activates. With Scott and Jean helping, they manage to hold off until Professor X can shut it down, and Toad flees just as Wolverine shows up to give him another scare on his way out. Nightcrawler, feeling guilty over the whole incident, teleports away and finds himself in the hangar with the X-Jet. Cyclops finds him and assures him that they all make mistakes and that he should stick around, and Nightcrawler agrees no doubt partially due to Cyclops' blatant lies about the performance of their jet. The SR-77 Blackbird. Twice as fast as the SR-71 and with three times the range and firepower. Come on, Psych. Twice as fast in a vertical takeoff landing package and three times the firepower of an unarmed spy plane? Next, I bet you're going to tell me about the 600 horsepower Hemi in your Honda Accord. Finally, the episode ends with Darkholm raging at Toad for running away after getting inside the mansion, before it's revealed that she's actually Mystique, and appears to be working for Magneto. Strategy X functions well as the first episode of the series. Unlike a lot of other X-Men series, the core team of Evolution isn't fully introduced for quite a few episodes, 
which gives the series time to grow into the team dynamic that the X-Men has traditionally been based around. In fact, before the end of this episode, the students consist entirely of Scott and Jean, and afterwards, only Nightcrawler is added. Like many Season 1 episodes, the dialogue is very stilted and dated sounding at times, a curse of its contemporary setting along with trying to portray teenage lingo. The story design of introducing a new team member alongside a counterpart antagonist character will be seen a few more times, and is an effective way to introduce two characters at once while also establishing some kind of relationship or parallel between the two. Toad and Nightcrawler are both outcasts in their own way, both of mutated appearances with Nightcrawlers looking more extreme, but Toad's resulting in more social distance due to his smell and gross habits, and both deal with this in their own way throughout the series, and both their mutations give them incredible acrobatic abilities along with unique movement. Most pairs introduced after this feature a personal connection before they join the team, but for Toad and Nightcrawler, their similarities come into play in later interactions. For this series, I'll be rating each episode from 1 to 10 based on the series itself. So a 1 out of 10 doesn't mean it's the worst thing ever, but more likely the worst X-Men Evolution episode ever. Similarly, giving an episode a 10 out of 10 doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's as close as the series gets. So, with that in mind, I'm giving Strategy X a 4 out of 10. It's a typical Season 1 episode that doesn't impress much, but also isn't terrible. It does its job of setting up the series nicely, but not much more. Tune in next time for The X Impulse and Rogue Recruit. I just want to talk. <laughs> you know, we'll get to know each other better. You know. Maybe do lunch. <laughs>